Greetings, friends. It's an honor once again to welcome you back to Rick's Garage. What you see before you is a 1982 Chevy S10 pickup. It's a project I reluctantly started a few weeks ago. At that time, I posted a diagnostic video. The truck came in with a brake problem. Before I go any further, I'm going to review what we found in case you did not see that previous video. When I went ahead and removed the cap to the master cylinder, I discovered that the front reservoir was empty. This means that the problem was in the back. Well, it didn't take long to discover that brake fluid was pouring out of the right rear drum. The cause of this was the wheel cylinder somehow lost contact with the brake shoe. With no resistance, the piston just blew right out. What had happened is the area of the backup plate that holds the wheel cylinder in place has rusted through, leaving the wheel cylinder quite loose, and I think that's why it slipped out of position. Matter of fact, I know that's why it slipped out of position. So, as I mentioned in the previous video, I've moved the truck outside, and I've got it up on the jack stands. The reason for this is because of that cap and those roof racks, I can't get it high enough in the garage to work comfortably. It's uh, early spring here in the Northeast. We're going to have enough good days where I can work on the truck. Today is a beautiful day in the 70s. Because the truck is so old, I'm having problems getting the parts, um, namely those backup plates that are rusted out. I ordered them from one vendor and they delayed me about a week and finally got back to me and said they were out of stock. So I've gone ahead and ordered them from a second vendor and I'm still waiting on them. Hopefully they'll come in before long. Okay, to get started here I'm going to go ahead and remove these brake shoes. I've already done that on the other side of the vehicle. Before you get too far along, I'd take a picture of this with your cell phone. Friends, I apologize for this. I had a camera malfunction, so you did not see me removing the spring from the self-adjusting rod. However, I did capture that on the other side, so I'll show you that very quickly. I love to use these needle nose vice grips for this purpose. They work great. Now with the springs out of the way, you can simply take your thumb, press down on the self-adjusting lever, and remove the rod very easily. Now using a special tool just for this purpose, put your finger behind the retaining pin and turn the spring about a quarter of a turn to release it. Repeat this procedure for the other side then the two shoes and the self-adjuster can all come off as one unit. Turn the shoes in such a way so you can easily slip out the emergency brake lever. Now I'm going to remove the emergency brake lever and slip the cable out of the backing plate. First of all, I'm going to clip a pair of vice grips onto the end of the cable. Now I'm going to rotate the lever so I can see the slot that the cable will slip out of. All right, so now I'll use brute strength to compress the spring, and I'm gonna to attempt to slip the cable out of the slot. Using a special pair of hose pliers, I'm going to attempt to compress those nasty prongs so I can slip that cable out of the backing plate. Thank you. 
I'm now on the other side of the vehicle. I just want to show you an alternate method for compressing those prongs. This is a special tool for that purpose I purchased at Pep Boys. You slip the tool over the prongs, thereby compressing them, and it allows you to easily slip out the cable. I'm ready to try to remove this wheel cylinder. I sprayed some penetrating oil on the brake tubing, but after a couple of attempts to loosen it, I realized that that's not going to happen. I'm going to need to cut it. I'll fabricate a new piece of tubing later on, and I'll leave a link on how to do that at the end of this video. Take an awl and pry out one of the tabs on the spring clip. Then use a hammer and punch to knock it out. Very easy. Well friends, it's rained the last couple of days, so it's precluded me from doing anything. Today it's not too bad out, a little chilly, but the sun's out. I'm going to try to remove this rear differential cover. I'm going to get started removing these flange type bolts. There are 10 of them in all. They're half inch. In the interest of saving time, I will come back when I've got them all out. Okay friends, now that all the flange bolts have been removed, I'm going to put one back up at the top just to hold that cover in place. I don't want it to fall when I pry it open. I've got a pan underneath to catch any gear oil, should there be some in there. The truck is approaching 40 years old, so I really don't know what to expect. Well, that's a good sign. Uh, there appears to be quite a bit of gear oil in there after all. So that's all I'm going to do today. I'm just going to let this gear oil drip out overnight, and we'll pick it up again tomorrow. Well, friends, uh, we're ready to remove those axles now. As you recall, we need to do that so we can install the new backup plates. I wanted to show you the tools that I'm going to be using to accomplish that. You may recall in an earlier video I had a bunch of old uh, obsolete and duplicate sockets laying around. The purpose of having these old sockets laying around is in case I need to modify one. Well, this is such the case that we have today. To separate the axles from the differential, there is an 8mm locking screw that has to be removed. I'm using 5 sixteenths. 8 millimeter and 5 sixteenths are virtually the same size. You need a six point because the, t the locking pin is very tight and you don't want to round it off. So as I just showed you with these uh, obsolete and extra sockets, I found a nice six point, 5 sixteenths, quarter inch drive socket and I was able to grind it down so that I'll have enough room to fit my ratchet in there and loosen that screw. The other tools I'm going to be using is a magnet to retrieve the C-clips, a pry bar to keep the uh, differential from turning, a small wrench if I need it once I get the uh, locking pin loose, and a uh, industrial type magnet this is to hold the uh, center pin in place so it don't fall out completely. So let's go out there and uh, see how we make out.
Okay friends, now that I've got that locking screw removed, I'm going to carefully rotate the differential to what I call the 7 o'clock position. I'm not going to allow that center pin to fall completely out. I'm going to have the magnet ready to hold it in just enough to keep that bottom spider gear from falling out. The spider gear you see near the top is in no danger of working its way out. But that's not the case with the bottom gear. The bottom gear can easily work its way out. That's why I'm leaving the pin partially in to keep that from happening. So now I'm ready to go around to the outside and push the axle in about a quarter of an inch or so so we can access the C-clips that we must remove. I'm going to use a pickup magnet to retrieve the C-clip. Then we can pull the axle out. Off camera, I'm going to repeat this procedure to remove the other axle. Okay friends, with uh, both axles out, I am going to push the center pin back in, return it to the 9 o'clock position as I call it, and put the locking screw back in. I'm not going to tighten it, I'm just going to put it in to prevent the center pin from falling out. This is how we'll leave it until we're ready to put the axles back in. Okay friends, with the axle out, the shoes removed and the emergency brake cable out, I'm ready to remove this backing plate. As you can see, I attached a vice grips to the uh, locating dog. There's a 7 8 uh, nut that has to be removed on the other side. I also have these two uh, 10 millimeter bolts that have to be removed down at the bottom. Okay friends, uh, as you can see I resorted to heating this bolt. There's no way it's coming off. I tried off camera. Now that I've got it good and cherry red, I'm going to put a 7 8 impact socket on it. I don't want to use one of my good sockets because of the heat. Okay, now that I've got it moving nice and easy, I'm going to get away from it. You don't want to risk burning yourself. Let it cool off, take a break, get a soda, whatever. But let it sit for a while and cool off naturally. So many times over the years I've burnt myself because I forget that something's still hot. So just get away from it. Now that everything is cool, I'm going to remove these two 10 millimeter bolts. They're the only things remaining that are holding on this backup plate. They're self-tapping bolts, so I'm not worried about them snapping. They should come out fairly easily. In an effort to move this video along a little bit, I've sped up the action here.
Okay, with those two bolts removed, this uh, plate should slip right off. Off camera, I cleaned up the housing a little bit. And now I'm going to try to remove the seal. Okay, off camera, I'm going to repeat this exact procedure on the other side. Okay, friends, uh, my backup plates finally arrived. I'm going to go ahead and install the wheel cylinders on the bench for visual clarity. A lot of people make a big deal about these, but I've been working on them since they came out in the 1980s. All you do is lubricate the clip a little bit and then just push it right on with your thumbs. There was one guy online that had this big contraption involving C-clamps and a special exhaust pipe that he made and a, and a pickle fork. It was ridiculous. Just uh, line it up, lubricate it, and uh, press it on with your thumbs. Now I'm ready to install the new seal. Take a plastic hammer and give it a few love taps just to get it started. Then take your seal driver and drive it the rest of the way in. Now I've seen guys try to use a block of wood. Um, you run the risk of damaging the seal so just go ahead and get yourself a seal driver. They're not very expensive if you're going to do this. I'm ready to install the new backup plate. I have two knockouts that have to be removed. One is for the emergency brake cable. The other one is for the adjusting spoon. I've marked them with white paint. Just take an appropriate size punch and give it a quick whack and the knockout will come right out for the emergency brake cable. You'll need a slightly smaller punch to knock out the adjusting spoon slot. Okay, so now I'm ready to install the new backing plate. I'm going to start the two small 10 millimeter bolts at the bottom first. I'm going to continue to speed up the action here and there to try to move this video along. I'm not going to tighten them all the way just yet, however. This flat square washer is the only part we're going to use from the old locating dog. It goes in the back. The new locating dog is going to secure the top of the plate. I'm using a special pair of locking pliers that are designed to clamp onto round surfaces. I purchased this at AutoZone if you're interested. These things are great anytime you need to clamp onto something round. Now that I've got that top dog tight, off camera I'm going to go ahead and finish tightening the two bottom bolt. Okay, lastly I'm going to take the emergency brake cable and slide it through that hole that we uh, knocked out. Alright, with all that done, I'm going to go ahead and repeat this exact procedure on the other side. What I'm going to do next here is, I don't think you can see it very well, but there's always a little ridge on the edge of your drums. Now these drums are in pretty good shape. It's not absolutely necessary to remove this ridge, but where I do indeed have a brake lathe, I'm going to go ahead and give them a skin cut and take that ridge out. It'll make it a lot easier to uh, slip them back on. I'm on the final cut of this drum. It seems to be cleaning up quite nicely. I'm not going to make you watch the whole thing. I'll come back when it's done. Well, as you can see, friends, the uh, drum cleaned up very nicely. I took about 15 thousandths of an inch off. So I will inspect. 
So we're going to go ahead off camera and do the other one. Well, friends, we're finally ready to install these brake shoes. The first thing I'm going to attempt to do is install this emergency brake lever onto this uh, spring cable. That's a lot easier said than done. It's very difficult to compress this spring, get this lever on. You almost need a third hand. However, I have a new tool you might be interested in. It's called a universal emergency brake tool. I purchased it from Amazon a couple of days ago. It only cost about 15 bucks. We're going to slip it in between the spring and the end of the cable. Then you simply squeeze the handle, thereby compressing the spring. And as you can see, the emergency brake lever slips right into place very easily. Well friends, in an effort to shorten this rather lengthy video, I went ahead and installed these shoes off camera. Install them in the reverse order that you disassembled them. There are lots of videos online on how to install brake shoes. Hopefully you took a photograph before you took it apart. The other thing I want to mention is you can take advantage of the fact that the axles are out. It's much easier to install these shoes with the axles out of the way. Okay friends, I'm ready to put these axles back in. As you can see, I've moved the differential back to what I previously referred to as the 7 o'clock position. I've slid the pin out part of the way and I'm using a magnet to keep it from falling out. Off camera I lubricated those new seals with gear oil and I'm ready to go ahead and slide the axles back in. Okay, I got that axle in. You'll notice I allowed those gears to move slightly. Try not to do that. Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, try to put the other axle in. Okay, so uh, now I've got a small magnet and I'm going to try to reinstall the C-clips. That, that one is in and I'm going to pull that axle back so it don't fall out. Now I'm going to put the other C-clip in. I'm going to move that in such a way that it don't fall out. And I'm going to try to pull the other axle back. Okay, with both axles positioned, I'm going to attempt to whoa, push this back in and replace the locking pin to move this back this way a little bit. Got to get the hole in the locking pin lined up just right. There we go. So we're going to tighten that up.
Right, now I have something where I can tighten that. I'll put it as tight as I can. Okay, so that's done. That differential is back together again. The axles are in. So the next we can go ahead and put the cover on. Well, friends, we're coming down the home stretch here. I'm ready to put the differential cover back on. It was very rusty, so I wire brushed it and I painted it with some heat resistant paint. I've got new bolts. The old uh, bolts were all rounded and rusted and I've got a new gasket. Okay, friends, I'm going to use a little dab of uh, Black Ultra to hold this gasket in place. If you're familiar with my channel, I very rarely wear gloves. Not like that guy we all know that has blue gloves and likes to talk with his hands. So I'm going to take a little dab of, uh, of Black Ultra here and there and just use it to stick on my gasket. Well, that looks pretty good. That should well hold the gasket in place while we're uh, installing the screws. Okay, friends, I'm ready to put this differential cover back on. Off camera, I prepared the surface. Now, I'm not going to use any Black Ultra on this gasket surface because if someone ever needs to service the differential again, I want the gasket to come off clean. I don't want them to have to scrape it off and have all kinds of debris fall into the differential case. All right, to save time, as this video is getting quite lengthy, I'm going to start the rest of the screws off camera, and I'll come back when that's done. Okay, friends, uh, I'm going to tighten these in a crisscrossing pattern. You don't want to go around, say, in a clockwise pattern. You want to crisscross them. I'll do a few, and then I'll finish the rest off camera. With the differential cover installed, we can go ahead and add the gear oil now. Off camera, I cleaned around the filler plug to minimize any debris that might fall into the differential. I'm using the end of an ordinary 3 8 drive extension to loosen the filler plug. Sorry folks, I just banged the camera again. One of the most difficult things about working with a camera is allowing yourself enough room to work and also giving your audience a decent view of what you're doing. This vehicle takes two quarts of 80-90 gear oil. I'm going to start filling it and I'll come back when I'm done. Okay, as you can see friends, I couldn't put any more oil in if I wanted to. It's oozing out of the filler hole. So I'm going to go ahead and put the plug back in. Okay friends, uh, we're now ready to reinstall these drums and adjust them. Now, a lot of people get confused about which way to turn the self-adjuster. Now, this lever pushes down on the adjusting star when you apply the brakes in reverse. So, we're going to be adjusting it from the other side. So, what we need to do with our adjusting spoon is to push up on it so it will turn in the same direction. Okay, uh, first of all, I'm going to attempt to slip this drum on. There we go. Okay, friends, I'm going to put these thick washers on here. And I'm going to put a couple of lug nuts on in reverse just to hold this uh, drum in place so we can get an accurate adjustment on it. 
this uh, drum is twisting around, then it may not allow us to accurately adjust it. We want the drum in the exact position it's going to be in when the brakes are under operation. Okay, I just got a finger tight, but that ain't going to go nowhere now. So now we, we're free to turn this thing and we can make our adjustments. So like I showed you with the drum off, I'm going to go in there with my adjusting spoon. And I am going to do it in such a way where I'm pushing up on the adjusting star to match the way the lever would be pushing down on it. And we're going to do that till we start to feel some resistance. Now as I'm adjusting this, I'm going to keep moving it till I start to feel a little tension. Nothing yet. Starting to feel a little bit. Right, it's getting a little tighter. All right, now that's a little bit too tight. We don't want this rubbing to create all kinds of friction. So we're gonna back off on it a little bit. So I'm gonna try to turn it the other way. All right, I like that. It's turning free and uh, we've got it out so it's pretty close. Okay, friends, this looks like it may be a good place to end this video. It's become much longer than I had originally intended. All that remains to be done is to hook up the brake tubing to the new wheel cylinders. As you recall, I had to cut one, so I'll be fabricating a replacement. Then I'm going to attempt to extract the bleeder nuts from the front calipers. If successful, I'll replace them. I'm going to be using my Motive Power Bleeder to flush the system. The original brake fluid looked like mud. I don't expect many of you to have a power bleeder. If you don't, there are many videos on YouTube on how to manually bleed the brakes, so I'm not going to go into that. Before I go, friends, I'll be linking three videos at the end. One will be my video on my Motive Power Bleeder. Another will be how to fabricate brake lines. And lastly, I'll post a video on how to abstract bleeder nuts. To your right will be a picture of my avatar in the form of my trusty German Shepherd. By all means, feel free to click on him if you wish to subscribe. So thanks again for watching. I apologize once again for the length of this video. And we hope to see you all again very, very soon.